Yeah, my idea of camping is bad room service and... <laughs> Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right. So this episode, I'm with Troy and Jerry. I'm going to shut up. and You guys are going to tell us about yourselves. <laughs> well, my name's Troy and uh, really into history and into the outdoors. So Jerry and I decided to combine the two into a trip. Okay. Jerry. Yeah, I've been living in the Northwest uh, since I was a teenager and traveling all over. I love hiking. I like extreme hiking, and uh, I also like history. So that's a lot what took me on this was the history that we actually followed. That's right. This. So what was the inspiration to get started? I mean, where did this come from? Because I've lived here all my life, and Tolme is a state park to me. Right. And right. So how did you... Come up with this. Well, in when I moved here in 1980, my uh, my uh, Washington State history teacher was went really deep, and that's where I first heard about William Tolmy. Oh, and uh, so I found out about his journey back then, and it was about the time I got to be 21 years old or so. I thought I want to recreate this trip. No one's done it before, and so it's been on my radar ever since then. So that's where the idea came from. So it took a few years to, to, to execute. <laughs> 34 or so. Uh, yeah. who's, who's got it? <laughs> So how, well, why don't you tell the audience who William Tolmey was and why this trip was uh, significant? So let's, uh, let's split it up a little bit. I'll, uh, so William Tolmey, he worked for the Hudson's Bay Company. He came over here when he was 21 years old. He was a doctor. And back in the day, uh, most doctors were also botanists because they harvested their own plants to make medicine with. And so he was stationed at uh, Fort Nisqually, modern day DuPont, uh, for a time. And that's when he went on his journey there. Uh, yeah. And re reading his exploits, you know, they were kind of hard to come by, too. So, you know, other than his original transcripts that he wrote, uh, nobody really researched this until probably the mid 1900s when some of the mountaineers kind of dug into the history. Yeah. Aubrey L. Haynes wrote about it in the 1950s. OK. And uh, that's when they found out the history changed a little bit um, from my understanding that, you know, um, you know, retracing his route uh, told me peak. Up outside of Mal, which is was originally where they thought he he might have been at the beginning, but he was that's well far off the mark uh, as far as his traverse went and and where his original uh, uh, goal was and where his original he ended up at the end. And uh, it was really mind blowing to see how that could have transpired for 150 years or 140 years, and then we figured this out. And so history changes as we reread it and we kind of figure it out, and that's almost. What happened here? Well, we have some some advantages nowadays with uh, Google Maps, Google <laughs> Earth. Uh, you can go and fly over a place and really get a good look at it. Uh, we're back in the 50s. Uh, they're lo just looking at a paper map and then going out in the field. Um, so you get to get a real good look at, at things and get a good feel for things. Okay. When you're reading the journal and studying Google Earth and then you go go out in the field with that. So before we start talking about the actual excursion, why was Tolmey State Park? So what what was Tolmey famous for enough that he got a park? Or am I going down the wrong Tolmey path? No, that's the same guy. Okay. Same guy. Uh, that's named after him because Fort Nisqually was also very close to that area where, right. where the park's at. Okay. Uh, he was just a, a landmark figure here. Uh, he ended up being the uh, superintendent of Fort Nisqually for decades. Okay. Uh, he was instrumental in helping the first American settlers in the area. He would meet them with a with a wagon full of beef when they had just come across the Oregon Trail. And um, he was just a really good man. He was friends to the Indians, friends to the local settlers. He was a peacemaker during the Indian Wars. And, 
Okay. It's a good man. So what year approximately did William Tolmay do this hike? He did it in 1833. 1833. Yeah. Yes. And approximately how long did it take him? I would say it took him 10 or 12 days, if I remember right, because he returned as well. So right. we, we just did the trip up and we got picked up. So, you know, I, I think it took him about half the time to get up at, to come back down. That's that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You're spot on. So where did he start from? He started at Fort Nisqually, which in 1833, it was located on what's called the Home Course Golf Course in DuPont. Okay. There's a there's a lake where you start golfing at. It's called Old Fort Lake, named after the Old Fort location there. Is that where you guys started? We did. We started our yes, day we there. Did. Touch so, the water. <laughs> so let's talk about day one. What time did you guys what time did you guys get started? And so my mother, 84-year-old mother, took us there at five in the morning. So your mom dropped you off. I gotta make fun of you. Your yeah, mom, right. mom dropped oh, yeah. you off. <laughs> well, this, I'm proud of that actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Give us a good hug. <laughs> absolutely. Uh so yeah, she dropped us off at five. Five in the morning. Five in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had uh forecast for a little bit of heat that week, so we wanted to start early. <laughs> it was a little 108 that day. It was, was a little warm. 108. <laughs> 108 was yeah. the forecast that day. Yeah. Uh, so from the home course, where, what was the direction? I mean, you're going to head east, but what direction and where'd you go that first day? Well, it's actually kind of counterintuitive. We headed north uh, to Stillicum okay. first because uh, that's what he did. He had to go there to uh, pick up the rest of his party. He went with um, five uh um, indigenous people. Okay. Yep. Yep. So he went there picking up some other people and getting horses and whatnot. And from his journals, we had a really, really good idea of exactly where his route went. There were only so many uh, trails at that time to follow. Okay. So you went to Stillicum. Went to Stillicum, uh, which at that point we picked up uh, the old Natchez Trail, now called Military Road. Okay. And basically followed that all the way to the Ording Valley. And how long did that take you? That was a couple of days. That was We did uh, day one. We went from DuPont to Raymond Hayden's house. Another Raymond Hayden reference in the podcast. Go figure. <laughs> Oasis in the desert. <laughs> but as you were telling me earlier, you believe that. Raymond's house actually was very close to where he told me may have stayed. Absolutely. I definitely do believe that. Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had a, a sheep station called Sastuck Station that is literally right next to Raymond's house. And the way Tommy described his first night, uh, those Gary Oak trees, rolling hill, it it looks like the spot. So that definitely felt felt historically accurate. So to keep it historically accurate, did you sleep outdoors at Raymond's house or no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We oh, did. did. Okay. And the sprinklers went off on us in the middle of the night. That's a historical reputation. <laughs> Raymond, if you're listening, please get the combination to that. Yes. To that sprinkler system. Yes. Uh, Cause we're coming next summer. So the sprinklers went off though. That's a great way to wake up. <laughs> yeah. What time did those go off? You know, right think when we we're going to bed about 10, 10, 10, 30. And then again, <laughs> like, uh, what, six in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> now, it was supposed to be 108 that day, so maybe it was refreshing, but probably more shocking than... <laughs> well, we were sitting, well, both of our beds were right on top of sprinklers, and so... <laughs> and I remember Raymond saying, I thought that was a mountaineering tent. I'm, yes, for 108 degrees. Uh, so, it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> it was pretty uh, funny. And... Uh, his wife's the only one of the combination, and I guess he's never needed it before that time. So, again, Raymond, I hope you get the combination. Yeah, yeah she was out of town at that time. <laughs> so, your first night passes relatively uneventfully. <laughs> yes. Day two. What was the journey like on day two? Uh, day two traveled uh, from that area down to the, the canyon area on, on Puyallup. Down again, military road and uh, into the Ording Valley. Uh, we cut 
through Rogers High School at one point, and we followed a pretty close trail because there were markers. There was historical markers all along the route. Um, it was a hot day. Um, we had to kind of improvise as far as the roads go. Uh, by far the most miserable day of the trip, actually. The urban hiking is really tough. It was really tough. Um, I think it was 114 that day. Yeah, day two was hotter than day one. Yes. Uh, but you could definitely feel feel the old trail. You could feel military road. And as we hit each marker, you you, you could feel the flow of, of how it went even the 200 years before. Um, but that was a tough day and it was a tough, it was a tough hike. Um, urban walking's not as much fun and you are very exposed. Uh, we, we also came across a lot of things that kind of surprised us, you know, the, the amount of garbage along the roads. We were kind of surprised, you know, normally we're driving these roads. Um, you don't notice it so much when you're driving, you don't when you know. walk it, you see every piece. Yeah. So some things made some impressions on us as far as that went. Uh, you know what really made an impression on me was the uh, cervezas and uh, and margaritas at the historically accurate Mazatlan restaurant on South Hill. <laughs> oh, that one's that's a historic Mazatlan restaurant. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's really refreshing on a hot day. And they let you bring your backpacks in there, so uh, that was a good deal. It was the first time since Tacoma, I could bring my backpack into an establishment. <laughs> uh, we were definitely confused as being homeless. Uh, a couple of times, but not not there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tr- Troy did stop to tie his shoes uh, in in Parkland, I believe it was, and uh, some guy came out from his house and offered us water and snacks, and really thought we were homeless until he saw our backpacks and our hats a little up close. But what a nice, friendly gesture! And I hadn't expected that. If I was homeless, that would have been the nicest thing. We definitely needed it, and so it was so a sweet. It was a real say. kindness thing that it impressed me yes and of course we took him up on his offer of course yeah, yeah. and so whoever you are thank you for yeah that's so right much. so Amen. much Amen. restoring our faith in humanity so the walk on day two is about how many miles another 20 and you could actually see in your mind um that's that's the intersection where the oregon trail split off to go down to oregon or you could come across and and you could see the intersection there it, you know, being 114, I've never seen the Oregon Trail empty, <laughs> but Troy and I had it to ourselves that day between shade spots. Uh, so the Oregon Trail there is a really popular place to ride bikes. People go jogging, just go for walks, take their kids out. And it's all, always really busy, especially in the summertime. Uh, we got there, looked up and down the trail, not a person in sight. I think we might have saw a total of like three people on yeah, the trail. It, it was just one of those days where no one, everyone was home. No one's going to go hike 20 miles <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> that was by far the toughest day for me out of the whole, the whole route. Okay. And so where'd you stay on day two? Uh, we stayed down at um, a friend of Troy's house, Sherry. Sherry Thanks. Smith. And let's put a, a what a hospitable, uh, great house. We Again, we slept outside. We slept on a nice bed of moss. It was comfortable. We, she had no sprinklers. We could see the mountain, what we had to go through, you know, to get there. Uh, definitely needed that respite. Um, and I think we came up with a different strategy at that point uh, because the heat and the and the two days before we, we had to change our strategy. Uh, we, we were getting out about eight, nine o'clock in the morning or six, and we just weren't going to make it the next few days like that. So I think that's where we decided the strategy to, to cut it was going to be to get up three or four in the morning. Yes. Which we did. And, uh, we, we'd hike till about 10 in the afternoon and then we'd go to sleep till three or four in the afternoon and then get back up and hike, hike the evening. Okay. So that's where we started sleeping twice a day instead of once right. a day. Yeah. yeah, it worked out really well for the heat. So one question I didn't ask before we get started, what month did Tommy do this in? He did it in late August, early September. So he might have had a little bit cooler weather then. He was in rain most of the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you replicated that at Raymond Hayden's house with the sprinklers. Yes, we Cor- did. That's correct. The- <laughs> okay. So correct. more historically accurate thanks to Raymond Hayden. And he also rode horses till he got to Ording. So we did walk that part. And, okay. Right. And he did stay in two, two uh, shanties on the way. Okay. So we, we felt like we were true to form coming out of that. That's right. Okay. That's right. 
So day three started early then. Day three started really Very early. early. Yeah. And that's where we hit the woods. We left civilization and roads behind at that point. Okay. So what was that like when you left civilization? No Mazatlan. No Mazatlan. That's right. It was well, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it really was. It really it was. It was wonderful. And as you leave the Ording Valley, uh, you know, there's the foothills. And there, there, there used to be a lot more civilization and farmland going on. And some of that's been just uh, kind of taken up by the river and, and the wetlands and the new laws we have. But there was a lot of homesteads back there that I had no idea. And going up that river was magnificent. So you went up the river? Up Puyallup River from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, followed uh, followed his path, which was up the Puyallup to the Mowich River and then up the Mowich River. Okay. So day three was about another 20 miles, 10 miles? It was a little bit less. I'd say we probably knocked off 15 or 16 that day yes. in a okay. two-walk two shift. Um, and and I, again, I felt like we were true to form. We, were, we had his transcripts, and we read them each night. And, and so each time we made camp, I felt like it would have been about the same place he, he made camp. And He would describe his campsites very well. So uh, hmm. what he could see up towards the mountain. And so you could really make out uh, where he was at. In his journal, did he ever explain what the draw was for him? I mean, the, what was the compulsion to go? So that's what I think is a funny story. So he said he was going on a botanizing excursion to get plants to use uh, medicinally. Uh there's some theories out there that I subscribe to that he just became enchanted with the mountain and wanted to go see it up close. He was a 21 year old kid. He had an adventurous spirit. I think he just wanted to get up close and I think he wanted to climb it actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. So night number three, where were we at? Where did you guys stay on night three? It was Ladout Creek. Ladout Creek. Right. Um, staying true to form too. Um, you know, uh, you know, we had some difficult challenges with the heat, and then we had to cut through the woods, and, and you know, cutting through cut, uh, uncut timber, you know, virgin forest, it's not very fun. And uh, I know he had a, a scout team with him, five Indians, and so they said they crossed the river many times. Well, Troy and I didn't have the option; the river is running so high, we could never cross anywhere. So we had to we had to hit the hills when the river would come down and meet the trail. And it made a, a, a pretty laborious, uh, you know, we'd go you know, one one mile in, in an hour or two at certain yes. points. You know, uh, those moments I, I was getting very low spirited about because, yeah, we wouldn't get get far fast if it was much of that. And so I was reading some of the transcripts and some of the things that stuck out to me about Tommy is he wrote about some real life human emotions. And so. One one part of his transcript said how he was embarrassed uh, that he couldn't keep the same pace up as the Indians. And uh, he said he felt almost like a girl walking with the Indians. And I could totally uh, relate to that. And then there was a, a little later in the trip uh, before they got to the mountain climb where um felt like a little bit of revolt was happening with the Indians. And he even described he got up and he had nothing on but a blanket, not even trousers. And he got them all <laughs> together and he... And he kind of and he, and he kind of riled everybody up and said, "We are going to make this. No one's turning around." And uh, I can imagine, you know, a, a few days I felt like the same thing, just getting up without oh, yeah. any pants on, telling Troy I was done. <laughs> so that, but I can I, I, I felt his pain. I felt, and he was he was really honest. He was really honest in his transcripts about it, even as long ago as it was. He didn't try to macho it up. And, Right. I like the fact that you you wanted to keep it historically accurate. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we did. Uh, we had some magnificent camps. We saw some magnificent sunsets. And uh, dealing with his transcript, we'd wake up in the morning. And he said he could see two peaks, and we walked around the corner, and there were the two peaks. And so we knew we were on the right trail. Okay. And we knew it was significant, actually. Yeah. So on day three, was it is hot? What, where's where's our temperatures going right then? So day three, it actually, it felt like it cooled off. We were gaining a little bit of elevation and we were in the shade of the forest most of the time. Okay. So it felt like it was cooling off. A, a chilly 98 maybe. Right. Yeah. Chilly 102 right. or so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> day four, 
Well, let's stop for your first three days. <clears throat> what what's most memorable out of those first three days for you guys? Well, uh, most memorable thing for me is when Jerry had had it with the shoes he was wearing. That was on day two. And he goes to an outdoor supply store and buys some new shoes. Right next to Mosset Lawns, by the right. way. So I felt like I was. <laughs> That's right. It was right next outfitters. to Mosset Lawns. <laughs> uh, it was the urban hiking. And uh, I hike a lot, and but never really hike 30, 40 miles just on pavement. Um, I could do it in the woods, but that is a different pattern that your feet take. Um, different pattern that your legs are hitting the pavement. It, it, it really it wore on me. The the forty miles of urban walking was tougher than the than you thought. Sixty miles of uh, through the woods. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not a, a hiker, but aren't you supposed to break the shoes in a little bit before you like? I mean, well, wasn't that a kind of a for, for a, sure? For sure. I just never had walked twenty miles urban walking. Is I. Uh, <laughs> So and you had had it with those shoes. I had had it with those shoes. You threw them straight in the dumpster, didn't well, you? Or did they take them? them? Yeah, I, yeah. hundred dollar Keens. I just left them at the store. I said no more of those. <laughs> oh my gosh! They so live right. and learn. Live and learn. So they were that, smelling pretty right by then too. So that was that was a notable. Uh, okay. Yes. What do you think Tolmey did though? He didn't. It, in all seriousness, the guy wasn't going to be able to stop it and pick up another pair of boots. <laughs> well, he was still on a horse at that point. Um, okay. So he hadn't walked those 30 mile lives. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you think about it, these guys didn't have the luxury that we have of having a margarita and buying new shoes. For right. Sure. Right. You know, and I'm really curious about his foot weather, footwear. Uh, he doesn't describe his gear super well other than the blanket and no trousers. Right. Uh, but he doesn't discuss were they in moccasins? Were they barefoot? I don't, I don't know. And I'm really curious about that. Okay. Personally, I feel like, um, especially like the walk down when we were exhausted, there was no other option. And they probably walked everywhere anyway. Uh, it's not like we do. They, I, I'm sure they, they put miles in. That was just a normal course of business sure. for them at the, those days. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. For, for sure, if you'd asked me if I was going to walk from DuPont uh, to Ording on two of the hottest days of the year, <laughs> uh, and, uh, the only problem I was really going to have was my shoes. I'd say that's probably a good deal right there for me. But uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So day four, was it another early start? Day four was another early start. Very early start and uh, really pretty country. Actually, we ran into uh, some elk. Actually, we uh, ran into some bear dens. Uh, that's when we, we, we slipped in. It was that the day we slipped into the rim of the uh, the edge of... No, that was day three. Oh, uh, yeah, the canyon in the Mowich a little bit. Oh, oh, yeah, we were up going up the Mowich. We actually went into the park on day four, right? And so, you know, one of the things that impressed me was Electron Dam and the flume. Um, so, oh, yeah, the flume. I'm, I've known about Electron Dam my whole life, but I had never. So we walked across the Puyallup River from the Electron Dam for a good ten or fifteen miles, and it was a sight to behold. It was beautiful engineering structure up on the. There's a wooden flume that they built along the hillside that goes for miles and miles. And you, it was on the other side of the you, river. You'd never from us. see it unless you came in this way. You'd never see it. Yeah. Is it still in use? Yes, it yes. is. Wow. And it still wouldn't. Yes. Yep. Wow. That is surprising. I know. I know. So uh some of those things impressed me. Um uh you know, one of the one of the piece of garbage that we kept seeing constantly speaking of garbage especially in the park and things we got to pick it out from a long ways away and you wouldn't believe it but uh mylar balloons we saw so many that were here yes, and there and there and there it was a pretty common type of garbage to be up in the woods and honestly that was uh for a long stretch that was the only garbage we saw right yeah right people don't think about that but i think they pollute more than <laughs> interesting yeah i wouldn't have thought about that but it makes sense, but I wouldn't have thought about it. Right. So we did follow uh, the Malwich in um, to the park. And okay. uh, should we should we talk about the logging area that we feel about? Or, yeah, uh, I, think, I think we should. Yeah. Okay. So right before we entered the park, I uh, came across this just absolute destroyed devastation area that was about, what do you think, it was a mile deep, right. Jerry? Yep. There's a swath right on the National Park boundary. 
Um, I've seen it before, uh, the Clearwater Wilderness by Enumclaw. And I believe the uh, timber companies do that to keep uh, keep the parks from ever expanding their boundary. But this land was just destroyed. It looked like, uh, you know, I've seen logging areas after and, you know, they can last a lot. Of, do it responsibly and the area can be clean. But this was strewn with logs back and forth with root balls in the middle of where you should. There was no way to really make your way through this whole area. It, it took us a long time to walk across this mile and just made me sad, actually, that somebody would destroy a piece of the earth for whatever the reason. Uh, but but th- th- that, that was just a really heartbreaking, heartbreaking thing to see for me. What made it so striking is we had just come out of the most beautiful forest, beautiful old growth forest, just pristine, green, lush as it could be into that and so the the contrast was very striking and yeah we stepped over a line and we were into the pristine uh, mount rainier national park after that that's so, right okay that's it, right it, it, it was crazy but and from there it was just beautifulness from yes. there yes and we actually were back on uh, uh trails okay yep high ball and trails now were there any more markers once you hit the national park is there were there more markers to follow or oh no we lost uh, okay. we left the markers behind when we got to the Oregon Valley okay yeah all right so day four you make it in into- day, day four we make it in and we're not exactly sure of Tommy's route at this time because it got a little bit dissipated at, at, um, <clears throat> there's different stories of maybe he missed the fork of the Malwich. Uh, and he still thought it was the Puyallup that he was running up there there's different kind of theories on Am I right about that, Troy? Yeah, we actually, uh, we plan on going back before the big snows come and going back to that spot we're talking about right now Mm -hmm. and taking another look at it. Okay. Uh, Because honestly, we were were whipped at that point and there was this beautiful Wonderland Trail that we could follow. So we followed the Wonderland Trail up towards the Mouch Lake area. Okay. So we knew where his end destination was and we knew where he came out of the woods but we don't really know exactly the creek that he went up. And that's to be determined by a lot of people have tried to interpret it. And uh, we, we do know where his end, his, his ending destination was. Right. Um, and so that's why, you know, it, it was a little easier to kind of come over and get into the Wonderland Trail, which uh, really wasn't prepared to hike yet. We, I think we were bushwhacking over a tree about every 300 feet that was across the trail. So yes. we we're definitely the first guys that, that, that trail placed up there this year. Okay. Um, which made it even more special. It was a little more work, but uh, that's where we saw our first uh, person in a couple of days was was right around there. Yeah, right. So you went you went a, over a day without seeing anybody else, but yeah, we but went over two days with uh, yeah. just the two of you, yeah, looking yeah. at each other. Yeah, in yeah. today's society, that just seems really unnerving. I'm just gonna. <laughs> say, I mean, if you think about it, yeah. I know Jerry earlier you said you just spent seven days in the Grand Canyon by yourself, basically. Right. Um, and I don't know how I feel about that. It terrifies me personally. <laughs> Not for you, but for me. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there is a feeling when you're getting out of the car and the radio shuts off and the heater's done. And yeah. And you step out and you go, I'm not going to be back for a while. Uh, but that feeling, you know, it, it dissipates with every step you take out there. And and it's all about being prepared. And that's that's how you feel about it. Um you know, I have a radio called The Birds, and, uh, you know, we were very entertained. There was never a time we were bored. Oh, and how about the creek? Remember the creek? Yeah, that was a, was a weird phenomenon, and I've had it for a couple of years. But if, if I sleep next to a creek, I actually hear music, like rock and roll music, country music. And so when we got uh, stayed below uh, in the park, uh, Troy and I, bivied for a couple nights and he stayed on the other side of this tree as as i did and so the second night after we were done i was like man did you play your did you play was that your phone i kept hearing and he said i thought that was your phone and he had been hearing the same i thought jerry had a radio we crank both hear music. sounded like bob seeger and the silver bullet band to me and both of us could have swore the other guy was playing his radio and uh no i mean wow <laughs> yeah That's, yeah okay so where did you stay on night four? Uh, well, it's, it's, just, it's uh, just up from Mowich. Mowich. Mowich, Mowich River. River. And yeah. Okay. It's a secret spot that okay. I probably wouldn't brag about. Okay. Uh, but it was beautiful. And we were right in the trees. And we were accessible to get to Spray Park. 
uh, which is where we needed to go. So, the, um, you know, what was interesting about that camp is that tree Jerry described earlier. It was probably uh, maybe five feet around, five feet tall is laying on the ground. Jerry's camped on one side of it. I'm on the other. We couldn't see nor hear each other. With the creek right next to us, we, if we had talked, we couldn't have even I, heard each other. I did shout at him, and uh, he couldn't hear me. So, Well, he thought you were Bob Seger. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we were. Uh, I it was, totally like I was camping solo. <laughs> wow. Okay. We saw a bear at that camp as well. That was the next day, though. So, yeah, our last morning, we were having coffee and talking about our, our, our get-out strategy. And uh, right behind Troy, there was a bear walking up the other side. It's three, 350-pound. Big boy. Black bear. As soon as he saw us, he was gone. But it, it really punctuated the end of our trip. It, it was like a blessing, actually. Yeah, super um, cool. Yeah, to know we were sharing the woods with. You know, so this was everything. the last day then. So you got up your last right. day. Yeah. And how far did you have to go on that day? Uh, we hiked eight eight miles to get out of there to okay. where our pickup spot was. Well, now we're missing the uh, we're missing the uh, high point. Okay. Yeah, let's yeah. get back to it. So sorry about that. Yeah. So from our our camp where we heard the uh, Bob Seger and the Silver Silver Bullet Band, we got up uh, uh, wee hours of the morning. What time was it, Jerry? Two thirty three. You woke me up because my alarm. Uh, I overslept my yes, alarm. Yes, you did. <laughs> he woke me up with uh, coffee. Yeah. So uh, I think we started about four because it was starting to get light about four thirty. Every time we tried to beat the light just by a little bit and uh so we made it up to spray park by about eight nine o'clock and there's a lot of snow we're we're smashing snow um a lot of snow yeah and and here's where we again we had to read his transcript because uh Hesson rock and mount pleasant is where a lot of people over the years had thought that that's where he was and it's the longitude and the latitude and the descriptions of the terrain that really give you the area where he went to Troy interpreted it, and I actually agreed with him uh, with the descriptions where he stayed, where he came into a verdant valley, which is Spray Park. Um, they stayed at a spot was only two hours away from Observation Peak. So the, the morning they got up to go to Observation Peak, it was two hours from their, their camp. And so, you know, we trudged our way up there. And as we walked back, we we walked back and we traced that two hours back. And we, we know pretty much where he he would have been within within a quarter mile I, I i believe if not closer his description was so good um yeah i kind of came to the conclusion that it was observation rock that he had climbed and not hessong rock or mount pleasant or uh Tolmy peak and so it wasn't until we were coming up the mowich and reading his journals that we really got the visual of what he was describing that that really confirmed that. So we had a hunch, but we didn't know for sure until we got up there. Okay. Right. And uh, so anyways, we go up to, uh, we're head up through Spray Park, up onto the Flett Glacier, uh, transitioned to uh, crampons and ice axes and and climbed Observation Rock. How high, and, is, how high is Observation Rock? Uh, it's just under 9,000 feet. Okay. Is it 8, I thought it was 94. Is it? Okay. Mm. So it's, it's a good ways up. It's a good ways up. It's a good ways up. Yeah. It's a good yeah. ways up. Okay. And so from the summit of Observation Rock, we we're reading his journals. And he says there's a feature that looks like a four-foot high dike on the left and on the right. And we look over. There's, oh, there's the dike right there. There's the dike right there. The description was to the T. It was, it was quite fascinating. Isn't it interesting that early explorers – when you read what they're what they're describing, and you can then see it, hundred years, two hundred years later, and then do you ever wonder if you were asked to describe the very same thing, how you would, how, what language I do. you would use? And right. I think I think English language used to be an art form, and I think um, for somebody to be able to transcribe, to describe, to be a botany expert, he. Uh, you know, actually was an artist too, you know, depictions and, and much less, you know, a, a politician, an explorer, member of the Hudson Bay. Uh, these guys were different breeds in the day. And uh, he was a true Renaissance man. Yes. So there wasn't any emojis. No emojis. <laughs> uh, 
And, you know, just like I described uh, uh, the blanket with no trousers right. morning and, right. and those kind of things, uh, <laughs> he was very upfront with, with a lot of his, uh, his descriptions and uh, didn't pull any punches. Uh, right. And, and I did appreciate that, actually. He, uh, it's truly historical that he was the first guy to get up and transcribe his route and give us any kind of idea where we could go as far mm -hmm. as, you know. But yeah. in all seriousness, it's if you guys, if you thought about what, what he wrote, what would you be writing today? If you, you, know, if you were going to describe that very same scene that you saw with the, the dikes on both sides, how would your description match what, what the, the words that he was using? I, I think you said the only English language was an art form. And I think I do agree with that. Yes. And I think the, but like for me, I'd be like, yeah, I was, da, 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 you know, be very brief and succinct. And I, well, 20 be, years from now, I'm going to go, what was he talking about? It'd be so different now because, you know, we'd whip out our cell phone and take a picture and there's no need to describe it well, because yeah. you can just show it to somebody. Right. <laughs> Here's the video. <laughs> Here's the video. Yeah. So we're way less descriptive yeah. and de less detail oriented, I think. Yeah. I yeah. Think that's something for me that's an interesting. And by the way, Observation Rock is 8,364 feet oh, above okay. sea level. But that's still a good ways up. Yeah. So, so yeah. You, you went up there and yeah. then you came back down. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And, you know, uh, it took us a long time to get there. And we looked at our our, our, our main objective for days as we were hiking. We, I, I imagine as Tommy did, too. And then other people, too. Uh, there's some sense of adventure that, you know, it's a little rough cut that maybe no one's gone on before. And if I'm not wrong, Troy, I think you and I are the first two people since 1833 to actually walk the steps that he's, uh, some people have traced his upper route, but nobody's gone all the way. Yeah. So it's almost 200 years. Um, right. And, and, and to me, the history in Washington state is still like a, a young thing for the state, uh, Midwest and East coast, you know, we've got hundreds of years. It's all been established and right. sussed out and you go to wounded knee and they got it. They know what's going on, but we do have some, uh, some history that we could be looking a little deeper at and appreciating in this state. Absolutely. And I hope we do and grab onto it. So that was the, you came back down, right? What are we, I feel like we've glossed over something. Like a toenail, maybe? Or... Well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what we glossed <laughs> off on. Um, so each of us, and I imagine, like like I said, the trousers and everybody wanted. There was one time, uh, you know, I wanted to quit. I felt like a, a, a leprechaun in, in Shamrock Forest. We were going through so many trees, and I was scooting along bear dens. And, uh, I, I, you know, there was a moment where I was like, and there was a moment when Troy says, you know, we're just not going to make it. We're not going to make it. And uh both of us had to look at the other one and say, you know, hey, man, uh, <laughs> it's time to suck it up. And so we did. We sucked it up and uh, we got stronger every day. I took care of the blisters I got before I bought my shoes and he took care of his toe and we ate well. And we we when I was tired, he went and got water. And when he, he was getting water, I tried to set up the tent. We had to work together. Absolutely. Um, you had to have more than one person there. It would have been really difficult. One person keep your spirit yeah. up yeah really scott to uh answer your question about the toenail uh the feet required <laughs> constant maintenance not mm -hmm. just daily but if you felt something going on with your feet you stopped pulled your socks off got out the band-aids and the uh and the uh, needle and took care of any blisters yeah. any hot spots wow and um my mm -hmm. left big toenail uh just gave up the ghost after on day three, on day three, just finally I took off my socks at a break and felt something hard in the end of my sock. What, what's that? Reached my hand in and pulled my big toenail out. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine though, if, if the, if Tommy's guides were barefoot, Can you imagine how, you know, uh, yeah, those guys. I uh, from what I read, they jogged through the through the trails because they knew their way up, and that's a that was a quick way for them to travel. And they also uh, one thing that enticed them to help him up here was they were already selling the elk fat that they were going to acquire on their hunting trip with him, which they never got any. <laughs> and so before what they, they left the trip, they were already negotiating with villagers down below about who's going to buy their elk fat. Okay, and so everybody had their own motivations on this. I, I'm, you know. Uh, 
Our motivation was definitely teamwork. Uh, we set a goal that was next to impossible. But the very last day, we got up to Spray Park and we got our crampons on and we started doing our glacier travel. And it was a mild 87 degrees that day, which we both felt great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and for that day, I didn't feel tired. My legs didn't hurt. I didn't feel a blister on my feet. We, we diced up the snow and uh, we could see our peak. It was closer than ever. And I never had felt better than ever, actually. Just that last couple me of too. miles. Me too. You, you, I didn't know I had 100 miles under me already. Or, um, it was emotional. It, it just emotionally yes. took over. Yes. Another strange thing on that day is when we descended, we were trying to follow our tracks back down the mountain, but it, it was melting so fast that the glacier had melted six inches an hour Wow! in an hour. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And and I took a couple of weeks after that, went up to Hesong Rock and Mount Pleasant and with the same descriptions that... that and, and and in my mind, I do not believe that that's where he went. I believe it as well after walking this as I ever did before when I had just read it. Observation Rock is, it, it, it definitely geologically has to be the spot that he went to. I think so. Description wise. Yeah. So how much gear did you guys take? Well, it was a two stage so uh, the, the night at Raymond's and down to Sherry's, you know, uh, we, we, we didn't have a lot of gear. We could, we'd have to take our snow climbing gear and our, our ice axe and that kind of thing. So then once we get to Sumner, we had to switch over to a little heavier backpack. And I'd say both of us had about 35 to 40 pounds right around that. I'd say tops. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what, what we did is we stashed duffel bags at Sherry's house. Um, do you think uh, the day before? Oh no! <laughs> but he rode horses. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we resupplied, and so we started with pretty heavy packs there. So yeah, you're right. It was. I normally carry a thirty pound pack, so this was definitely heavier than that. I'd okay. say closer to forty. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of food. A lot of food. Um, and then you know we both had our different um, philosophies in camping. So I brought a light tent, and you brought your cowboy uh, uh, tarp. Right, and so piece of Tyvek uh, building wrap. Right, and he, so like the third night out, we got to Ladau Creek, and your Tyvek would have worked weatherwise, but the mosquitoes were going crazy. So I set the tent up. You went to get water, and I remember when you come jumping that tent, you said, "I love you, Jerry." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I remember that quite I like that, I Jerry. I love you so much. <laughs> I know. thought I said I love your tent. Oh, <laughs> I heard. <laughs> so what'd you guys take away from this? I took away, there's uh, nothing that's impossible actually, you know, um, and, and nothing easy is, is really worth doing. It has to be a little bit of difficulty and it has to take some planning or, you know, everybody would have been on the Oregon trail that day and everybody would have take, it wouldn't have take 200 years to retrace this. Um, you really got to do your research. You got to do your preparation. Your body's got to suffer some amount. You know, you have to, you have to sacrifice something actually to do something meaningful. And for us to sacrifice what we did, I can't imagine what told me sacrifice back in the day. You know, you, you break a leg up there. It's not a helicopter. Uh, there's, there's no way to turn around, you know? Right. Um, and yes, you have to walk all the way down and, there's no ice cream in, in uh, waiting for you in Wilkeson. <laughs> did, did you guys have ice cream waiting for you? In well, Wilkeson? if you want to call a Mac and Jack ice cream, that's fine. Yes. But yes, we, yes. We did quaff. <laughs> we stopped for a quaff. Okay. How about you, Troy? What did you take away from it? My takeaway was really, I was even more impressed with the initial trip that Tommy did. That's just incredible for a young 21-year-old guy. I mean, so how ballsy is that? Yeah. To strike right. off with in his companion, same same thing. I mean, that's just a, a ballsy move. And after doing that trip, it was more impressive than when I had initially read about it. I was really uh, that sense of exploration and commitment. It was very impressive to me. So, how long did you guys actually plan and research the trip? When did you guys decide we're going to do this? And and what sort of prep did you do? So. Uh, gosh, I, I started probably just a few months before and, uh, 
ran into Jerry at our buddy, uh, Rich, uh, who owns Cockrell Cider. And Jerry was game. And I hadn't had any takers up to that point. So once Jerry committed, uh, that's when it became real. Okay. And then I started really researching the route in earnest. Um, you know, I'd already read Tommy's journals and about the route for years and years, but that's when I started, you know, uh, planning out all the steps, you know. So how long did it take you? I'd say a couple of hard weeks of uh, research okay. and map work. Yeah. So if you were going to do it again, what would you do different? Ride bicycles on the section that <laughs> told me rode, rode horses. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I'd say we did all that right. Um no, the only thing I, I, I would have done different is I would have liked to explore the Mowish River. Maybe had another day since we – things yeah. made more sense on the way down with his descriptions mm -hmm. as they did on the way up. And I don't know how to describe that. But um, once we had our, our our pivot point that we turned around and we had made our – a lot of things as we were coming down made more sense of what he did in his travels. And, you know, uh, I don't know. To me, Tommy Peak – that they named is totally erroneous and, and is so far off the mark from his, his expeditions that he took. And it's, it, it's great to have something named after him. And for me, Mount Rainier is like a friend to me as much as it is my backyard. So I'm always learning something new about her all the time. And it's really great to get to know another finger of her, another glacier, another walk up that I've never seen. Um, there's just so much, you know, you, you can go around that thing and never see it, the whole I've done the Wonderland Trail and I've I've gone, you know, since I was a teenager. Um, but, but yeah, so I think every time you can just get a little bit more in depth and find history, whether it's right or wrong, you can disprove it or understand it one way or the other. It really opens up things for you and for the people that you want to share it with, actually. Right. And Troy, you wrote a journal, which we're going to be publishing. And yes. By the time this goes live, it will be published. So there'll be the companion piece. Excellent. So there'll be two two pieces to this. What's next? Ah, uh, yes. So we do have uh, we do have a plan for next summer. Uh, a gentleman named Lieutenant August Kautz, uh, who was stationed at Fort Stillicum in 1857, came within 300 feet of the summit of Rainier. Him and four companions uh, got got really close. So we're going to retrace his steps from. From Fort Stillicum to the summit, but we're going to attempt to go to the right to the summit. We are going to the summit. There you go. We're not going to attempt. <laughs> okay. So you're going to summit, you're going to do a historical summit of Rainier. That's right. That's okay. right. And are we going to, so we, we're going to apply some of the lessons we learned here, and that is yes, bicycles. For, bicycles. <laughs> to replicate horses. Well, we learned some bicycles. We learned, um, so, you know, I've been, I've been overland for, for a long period. So Troy learned a little bit about, uh, we have a water filter, you know, yes. um, uh, uh, the, the bivy sack water filter and, and we were filtering brown water out of the Pialp the whole time. So the pump water filter was never going to work. These are the only ways that you can do these things. It's a gravity system. So okay. you just fill the bag up with water, hang it and let gravity do the work. Troy used his ice axe the whole trip and I, I had both and I would never bring poles again. I would just take the ice axe through the woods and, and up above mm -hmm. if I was going to trudge through that again uh, and will. Um, so I, uh, we both took a little too much food, which is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you guys eating on the, on the mainly freeze dried, freeze dried meals, right? Okay. Boiling water. Um, well, you just made the Puyallup sound appetizing there. Wow. Well, <laughs> yeah. It's actually better water than you're probably going to get down here. Uh, Once you, know, you get the mud out of it. I, I did freeze some. I did take a, a bottle of glacier water that was that was uh, draining off and brought it back home and put it in the fridge and pulled it out. And it was delicious. Okay. I mean, um, yeah. So freeze dried. Right. Freeze dried. <laughs> um, we, we had a little bit of a trail rum. You know, we'd hit, you know, we'd help, help fall asleep at night mm -hmm. uh, and the aches and pains. Um, top ramen. 
a lot of top ramen. And, and you think you want a gourmet meal out there. A lot of times what you want is your comfort food, and that's the best thing to eat. So uh, I've learned that, not to not to get a little too fancy. Just eat your, eat your you know. Just something that speaks to you, if you that, will. That's yeah. right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, we did learn about getting up early and then taking that, that afternoon bivy uh, really helps out. And if you're getting up early, you're going to be tired by the afternoon. So that, right. that was a good way to travel, I think. Um, we, it, nothing's a hundred percent. That's the thing is, you know, you were going to follow couch and we, we may get off track a little bit, but you know, uh, and about how long is that trip going to be mile wise? I up- just mapped it out today and it, I come up with 90.2 miles. Okay. It's shorter. Yeah. yeah. A little shorter. Yeah. But remember when you get in the woods, you start doing a little bit of this, it doubles. Yeah, did, you, did you have an odometer with quick. you by chance? No. I was, that'd be kind of fascinating to, to see how long, you know, how many steps you took during this journey. Yeah. It so went. when I did feel like the uh, leprechaun in Lucky Charm Forest, I was <laughs> trying to go over a log. I was hugging as this log was as big as a school bus. I mean, and you, know, <laughs> you have to get up and over it. And then there's another one after that. And the one, uh, uh, so it, here you are <laughs> trying to get a mile out and, and it could take you a long time at, at certain points. That's where I'm yelling back, Jerry, use your eye sacks. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's true. So that's why I learned. I think I mentioned learning that. It's true. Uh, and then I, I don't think I would ever be worried about going four or five or seven days, uh, especially with a companion helps. Um, right. Uh, you do get into a different mode where you don't need to talk all the time and you just eat and you're laying around and that's, that's totally satisfying. There's some different things that you find satisfying. Um, and you do, you do get the rhythm of the, of the land and you're going to sleep when the sun's going to sleep and, and listening to Bob Seger and listen right. to, and yeah. And the silver bullet band. band. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's fascinating that you guys did this also because we had talked about it. I think you and I had talked right before you were going. And, and then that weather just, it hit. was daunting. It and was you a- guys could not have picked a more, a worse time to do it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was so hot. Yeah. We both thought about that and turning around and changing it, but you know, dates and times you had the vacation schedule. And- right. Yeah. I had it all set up. Uh, the wife was out of town. <laughs> right. She went on a girl's trip to coincide with it. So if I rescheduled, uh, it would have just, just been a mess. So we were great, like, great hey. thing was I got my second COVID shot like a day or two before that. That's so right. I was flying by the seat of my pants. That's well. right. Didn't know it was. <laughs> uh, nothing comes easy, though. No. I'll, I'll say that. So we could have pulled out at any time. And we but you did that. it. You guys accomplished well, it. Well, we, right. we signed on for an adventure. And you got it. We got yes, it. Yes, we yeah. did. Well, I thank you guys for taking the time to share it with us. Absolutely. <laughs> As I sit here in this comfortable chair going, nah, it's not for me, but I'm glad you guys are having out there having the fun. Hey, and we're we're willing to take you anytime. Uh, you keep goes, offering and I keep saying thank you. No. <laughs> we'll find one in Wenatchee. <laughs> no, I haven't even done Saddle Rock. <laughs> it's two miles from my house. <laughs> well, you get that electric bike. We'll go right. There we go. There All we right. go. All right, guys. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.